Hey, so this is the third example we're going to talk about for connections and curvature. And here we're going to talk a little bit about characteristic classes and churn vial theory. So this is kind of, like I said in the introduction, sort of backwards from how this topic might normally be approached because normally you define connections and curvature, then you show that these things give characteristic classes. We're going to try and work our way back and talk a bit about characteristic classes and then again, try to rediscover the notion of connection from trying to build something that encapsulates the abstract things we've come up with. So we can start with the Euler characteristic. And this is something you might have seen in school, you might have seen in university. It can be said in a very simple way or it can be expressed in a much more complicated way. So let's start by just remembering or talking about what it is for polyhedra. It says that if you have some polyhedron, and you take the number of vertices, subtract the number of edges, and add the number of faces, you get a number, and this number can tell you things about your polyhedra. And this is kind of the, the first statement of what the Euler characteristic is. We can generalize it a bit further. For any finite CW complex, we can define the Euler characteristic as the alternating sum of the number of I cells. So we see that for two-dimensional things for surfaces, this corresponds exactly. I mean, we recover the equation for polyhedra. So this is really a good generalization in that we can recover our original motivating statement. And we can generalize this a bit further. For topological spaces, we can take the alternating sum of the ith Betty number, so the rank of the singular homology groups. For closed smooth manifolds then, there's this statement, which I will say and then explain a bit later, that the Euler characteristic is exactly the same as the Euler class of the tangent bundle evaluated on the fundamental class. Whatever these Euler classes are, you know, I'll talk about them in a bit, and whatever the fundamental class is, this statement tells us that for closed smooth manifolds, studying Euler classes lets us recover the Euler characteristic. In the same way that the Euler characteristic for finite CW complexes is a good generalization of the Euler characteristic for polyhedra, Euler classes, thanks to this statement, are a good generalization of the Euler characteristic. So what are Euler classes? They are characteristic classes, which are cohomology classes that we associate to a bundle. There's lots of different types of characteristic classes, but in general, this is the way of thinking about them. They are just classes in cohomology that tell you something about your bundle. This fact then that the Euler characteristic is the same as the Euler class of the tangent bundle evaluated on the fundamental class is a consequence of what's known as the Chern theorem or the Gauss-Bonnet Chern theorem or the generalized Gauss-Bonnet theorem. So let's talk a little bit about the original Gauss-Bonnet theorem. This is something you may have seen in a differential geometry class, the Gauss-Bonnet theorem tells you that you can calculate the Euler characteristic of a surface up to a factor of 2 pi by performing some integral. You can integrate the Gaussian curvature of your closed Riemannian 2 manifold over the whole manifold, and this gives you the Euler characteristic back. So something to note before we move on is that the Gaussian curvature can be expressed in terms of covariant derivatives and the metric tensor. So we can write it down like this as a nice equation. And writing it like this makes it look like, I mean, we've used very suggestive notation. This kind of looks a bit like a Nabla squared. I mean, maybe we could hope that somehow we can express Gaussian curvature as the curvature of some connection. And we can. And this is exactly, like doing this is exactly the generalization um, of the Gauss-Bonnet theorem that we just mentioned, the Gauss-Bonnet-Chern theorem. Let's be a bit more specific with what we mean here. One uh, example of the Gauss-Bonnet-Chern theorem, or one way of stating it, is that we can recover the Euler characteristic by an integral. Again, but we just are in a slightly more general case. So if we take some compact, orientable Riemannian 2n manifold, so here it's, it's very important that we work in even dimension, so we take some compact orientable Riemannian 2n manifold without a boundary, and we take the curvature form of the levi trevita connection, which is a connection on the tangent bundle. If we take the Fafian of the curvature form, and the Fafian is just some polynomial that satisfies a nice property, if we take the Fafian of the curvature form and integrate it, then again we can recover our Euler characteristic up to a factor of 2 pi n. Um, and you can actually generalize this further, you can do it on 
almost arbitrary bundles with arbitrary connections. There's a nice paper about this on the archive that you can go and check out, but this is just one specific example. But so what? Like, what does this have to do with connections and curvatures? I mean, just because the word curvature is in a theorem, it doesn't mean it's related to any of the examples we've talked about. But what this theorem tells us is that it looks like there's a link between characteristic classes, because we have the Euler characteristic on the right. And as we've said, this is a this is a specific facet of the Euler classes. That is, it's kind of a, a, a lower dimensional slice of the Euler class. It's one specific angle of looking at an Euler class is the Euler characteristic. So on the right, we've got the, a characteristic class. And on the left, we have something to do with the curvature of a connection. And churn vial theory is exactly the formal link that says characteristic classes and curvatures of connections are linked and they're kind of almost the same thing somehow. So I'm not actually going to talk about how churn vial theory works. There's already some great places to read about it. There's the book by Heubrecht, um, Complex Geometry it's called, which is a really nice one. But that's kind of an, a tantalizing taste of what churn vial theory entails. So let's just talk a little bit about some further things, some ways we can go beyond this. The gauss bonnet churn theorem can be generalized to get what's called the Attia-Singer theorem or the Attia-Singer index theorem. And this theorem is kind of everywhere throughout maths and physics. So for algebraic geometries, the herzebrush riemann rock theorem is an example of the Attia-Singer theorem. This is something that algebraic geometers love to use all the time. And it has some, you know, I mean, it turns up a lot. And within physics, uh, there are some pretty immediate links. There's a very famous paper about how the Attia-Singer theorem can be derived from the heat equation. And you can also derive it from some elementary properties of quantum mechanical supersymmetric systems. Um, I've put elementary here in quote marks because, I mean, I don't know. To me, there's kind of nothing elementary about quantum mechanical supersymmetric systems. But I suppose if you know what one is, then you can derive the Attia-Singer theorem without much knowledge about them, I guess. I'm not even going to pretend this is something I know about. But according to the veritable Wikipedia, the gauss bonnet churn theorem itself is useful in general relativity when you look specifically at four-dimensional things, or I guess three plus one, I suppose. I don't know. I don't know anything more to say anything more than three plus one in this situation. But there's some things you can look at if you're interested. Now then, uh, I'm going to do something I said I wouldn't do in the introduction, which is kind of link two different examples together. If we recall the first example, which was linear differential systems, we said that a connection was something that looked like d plus omega bar, where omega bar was some square matrix of one forms. And then the curvature, just by the definition of it's the connection squared, it's what happens when we apply the connection twice, can be simplified to d omega bar plus omega bar squared if we have some basis of flat sections, which by the Frobenius integrability we always can locally. Here when I say omega bar squared, I mean... I mean, you have a, a square matrix of one forms. What does it mean to multiply two of these together? Here it means you multiply them like you normally multiply matrices, but when you have to multiply the individual components, you use the wedge product of forms. There are some other things you can mean by squaring a matrix of one forms. You could take the actual, you could take the wedge product of matrices as well. And this is useful, but not what we want to do here. So here I really mean it's matrix multiplication with the wedge product. It's kind of the most natural thing you could do. So then d omega bar plus omega bar squared is a matrix of two forms. And we can take its trace. I mean, here I'm just saying things we could do without really giving any justification. But we could take the trace of this matrix of two forms. And we'd end up with a two form. Or more concretely, more correctly, I suppose, we end up with a bunch of two forms. Because we're doing everything locally. The Frobenius integrability theorem gives us local flat sections. You know, we said locally our connection looks like d plus omega bar. There's a lot of local statements going on here. So we really end up with a bunch of two forms because we end up with a two form on each open subset of our cover, if we have a nice cover. Because of this, we end up with something that we can think of as a check co-cycle in the Duram complex. That is, we've got a bunch of two forms on each u alpha, in our cover. So our cover is, say, u alpha, u beta, u gamma, blah, 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 blah. And you can show that you end up with a check co-cycle. That is, it satisfies some kind of co-cycle property on u alpha beta, on intersections. And if you do some classical homological algebra stuff using ext and 
you, you follow through what it means to get a splitting of a certain exact sequence and blah, 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 blah. You can actually prove that the check cocycle you get by taking the trace of the curvature of a connection is exactly the first churn class of your bundle. So the churn class is some characteristic class. It's the characteristic class in the setting where we have some kind of holomorphic structure normally. This says that this is a kind of concrete example of what we've been saying is that the first churn class is exactly given by the trace of the curvature of a connection. And the trace is what's called an invariant polynomial. And this is really what churn vial theory says. It says if you take invariant polynomials on curvatures, you get characteristic classes. So here's kind of a specific example of that. So something to note is that, as I said above, we've been doing everything locally. By this, I mean, you know, we use the Frobenius integrability theorem. It tells us that everything exists locally. But if we do some ho more homological algebra and we use something called the Attia class, then we can actually get a concrete link uh, between how characteristic classes and curvatures relate. And it turns out that the churn classes of a holomorphic vector bundle correspond exactly to the obstruction to the existence of a global holomorphic connection. So what do I mean by that? I mean that if you have a holomorphic vector bundle and you calculate its churn class in whatever way you want to calculate its churn class, you could think of it as a principal bundle and then pull back the generators of the, the cohomology of uh, B, I guess, G, L, N, C here and look at what the pre-images of these things are when you pull them back. You could calculate churn classes using splittings if you're in the algebraic setting, you know. There are lots of ways of computing churn classes. The idea is if you have any non-trivial churn class, then you cannot have a global holomorphic connection. You can have lots of local holomorphic connections, but you can't glue them together to get one big global thing. So I'll talk finally a tiny bit about some work that I've done in my thesis, just because it is very relevant, I suppose. I'm not just trying to plug my thesis here. What I do in my thesis, which is really building on this work, uh, by Green in the 1980s, is that in the holomorphic setting, you can always have local connections. This is like the Frobenius integrability theorem tells you that you can always find local flat sections. So we can kind of trivialize everything locally. We can always do local constructions. But the moment we have a bundle, which has a non-trivial first churn class, we cannot hope to ever find connections that glue together to give us some holomorphic global connection. Or said the other way, we can never hope to find some global connection that, such that its restriction on each open subset is the local connections we've started with. But what we can do is we can kind of average out all of our local connections on intersections using barycentric combinations. So, you know, on some intersection U alpha beta, we have a local connection on U alpha, we have a local connection on U beta. So what can we do on U alpha beta? Well, we can take kind of t nabla alpha plus 1 minus t nabla beta. You know, we can take this kind of linear combination of the two of them, and you end up with something which, when you take curvatures, isn't really a, a differential form. It's kind of a differential form with values. So here, for example, it has a value in delta 1. It has a value in the, the 1 simplex, the line from 0 to 1. That's what the t corresponds to. Doing all these things, generalizing it, everything takes values in simplices but you can somehow get rid of these simplices using something called DuPont's fiber integration. There's a lovely quasi-isomorphism of things, you know, there's all this fancy abstract stuff going on in the background. But kind of the moral is that we can generalize churn vial theory to get characteristic classes even when we don't have global connections. Like these local constructions are somehow sufficient to be able to do everything globally. If we introduce simplices to parameterize them, and then sort of get rid of the simplices at the end in a nice functorial way. And holomorphic vector bundles almost never have um, global holomorphic connections, exactly for the reason we've said. If they have a non-trivial churn class, then they don't have holomorphic connections. So this is a, a, a nice fact that everything we've done can still be done, even if it looks like it doesn't work at the first, first glance, which I guess is like a nice, I don't know, Nice life motto, I suppose.